Infinite Jest by David Foster Wallace, page 337. Pemulus tells Lord he cannot believe his fucking eyes. He tells Lord how dare he don the dreaded red beanie over such an obvious instance of map, not territory. Equivocationary horseshit, as Ingersoll's trying to foist. Lord, bent to the cart's blinking, Yushitiyu, responds that there seems to be a problem. Ingersoll is whistling and pretending to do the Charleston between Abu Kamal and S. Sueda, using his racket like a hoofer's cane. How finally spits. Under Pemulus's wild-eyed stare, Lord clears his throat and calls out to Ingersoll, tentatively positing that today's pre-game triggering situation negotiations established no valid strategic target areas in the postage stamp-sized nation of Sierra Leone. Ingersoll calls back across the Mediterranean that target areas of keen strategic interest appear in Sierra Leone at the exact moment the heads of state and total launch capacities of AMNAT and SOVWAR took it upon themselves to traipse into Sierra Leone. That Sierra Leone thins forward, as of that moment has, or rather had, he pretends to correct with a smile, become a de facto SSTRAC. If presidents and premiers wanted to leave the protection of their territory's defense nets and hold clicky little other combatant excluding parlays in some hut somewhere, that was up to them. But Lord had been wearing the white beanie that explicitly authorized the overexploited and underdeveloped defenders of the one true faith of the world to keep on pursuing their strategic interests. And I-R-L-I-B-S-Y-R was now keenly interested in the aggregate I-N-D-D-I-R points it had coming to them for just now vaporizing both supercombatant strategic capacities with one flaming sword of the most high-like strike. <laughs> and Kitten Plan keeps taking a couple of quivery steps toward Ingersoll and getting restrained and pulled back by Lamont Chu. Sleepy T.P. Peterson, who always looks a little dazed even in the best of circumstances, asks Otis P. Lord to define equivocationary for him, causing Hal Incandenza to laugh out loud despite himself. Just outside the theater's fence, Pemulus is bug-eyed with fury, not impossibly dream aggravated, and is literally jumping up and down in one spot so hard that his yachting cap jumps slightly off his head with each impact, which Trolsch and Axford confer and agree they have previously seen occur only in animated cartoons. Pemulus howls that Lord is in his vacillation appeasing Ingersoll in Ingersoll's effort to fatally fuck with the very breath and bread of Estraton. Players themselves can't be valid targets. Players aren't inside the goddamn game. Players are part of the apparatus of the game. They're part of the map. It's snowing on the players, but not on the territory. They're part of the map, not the cluster fucking territory. You can only launch against the territory, not against the map. It's like the one ground rule boundary that keeps Estraton from degenerating into chaos. Estraton gentlemen is about logic and axiom and mathematical probity and discipline and verity and order. You do not get points for hitting anybody real. Only the gear that maps what's real. Pemulus keeps looking back over his shoulder to the pavilion and screaming, Jesus! Ingersoll's roommate, J.J. Penn, tries to claim that the vaporized Anne kitten plan is wearing several articles of gear 
worth mucho I-N-D-D-I-R, and everyone tells him to shut up. The snow is now coming down hard enough to compose an environment, and everybody outside the sheltered pavilion looks gauzily shrouded from Hal's perspective. Lord is crunching madly away at the teepee under the just-opened protection of an old beach umbrella a previous game master had welded to the top of the food cart. Lord wipes his nose against the same shoulder that's clamping a phone to his ear, awkwardly, and reports he has checked the DEC's Escheton Axiom directory via pink squared capable modem and that unfortunately, with all due respect to Anne and Mike, it doesn't seem to explicitly say players with strategic functions can't become target areas if they traipse around outside their defense nets. Lamont Chu says, how come point values for actual players have never been assigned then, for Pete's sake? And Pamulus shouts across that that's so totally beside the point it doesn't matter, that the reason players aren't explicitly exempted in the ESCHAX dot D-I-R is that their exemption is what makes Escheton and its axioms fucking possible in the first place. A kind of pale boat wake of exhaust exits the idling Ford sedan off behind the pavilion and widens as it rises, dispersing. Pemulus says, because otherwise, use your heads, otherwise non-strategic emotions would get aroused, and combatants would be whacking balls at each other's physical persons all the time, and estrogen wouldn't even be possible in its icily elegant game-theoretical form. He stopped jumping up and down at least. Trolsch observes. Player's exemption from strikes goes without saying, Pemulus says. It's pre-axiomatic. Pemulus tells Lord to consider what he's doing very carefully, because from where Pemulus is standing, Lord looks to be willing to very possibly compromise Escheton's map for all time. Girls 16 through 18's borough rector, Mary Esther Toad, puts from left to right behind the pavilion on the long driveway, from the circular drive to the portcullis and holds her scooter and lifts her helmet-tinted visor and yells across for Kitten Plan to put a hat on if she's going to play in the snow in a crew cut. This, even though Kitten Plan isn't strictly in Miss Thode's, like, umbrella of authority, Axford observes to Trolsch, who relays this fact, into his headset. Hal moves his mouth around to try to gather up spit in a mouth that's gotten rather dry which, when you have a plug of Kodiak in, is not very pleasant. And Kitten Plan has been suffering from what look like almost Parkinsonian tremors for the last few minutes, her face writhing and her mustache almost standing right out straight. Lamont Chu repeats his claim that there's no way players, even with strategic functions, can ever be legit target areas if no I-N-D-D-I-R-S-U-F-D-D-I-R values have been entered for them in NSTAT's tally function. Pemulus orders Chu not to distract Otis Lord from the incredibly potent and lethal ground Lord's letting Ingersoll lead them onto. He says none of them have ever seen the true meaning of the word crisis yet. Ingersoll calls over to Pemulus that his emeritus veto power is only over Lord's calculations, not over today's game's God's decisions about what's part of the game and what isn't. Pemulus invites Ingersoll to do something anatomically impossible. Pemulus asks Lamont Chu and Anne Kittenplan if they're just going to stand there with their thumbs in their bottoms and let Lord let Ingersoll eliminate Escheton's map for keeps for one slimy, cheesy victory in just one day's apocalypse. Kittenplan has been trembling and feeling at the back of her vein-laced neck and looking across the Mediterranean at Ingersoll like somebody who knows they'll go to prison for what they want to do. 
Axford posits certainly very unlikely physical conditions under which what Pemulus told Ingersoll to do to himself wouldn't be totally impossible. <laughs> Hal spits thickly and gathers and tries to spit again, watching. Trolsch broadcasts the fact that there's always a queer, vague, vitaminish stink about Mary Esther Thode that he can never quite place. There's a sudden tripartite womp of three empire waste displacement vehicles being propelled above the cloud cover to points far north. Hal identifies Thode's ambient odor as the sink of thiamine, which for reasons best known to Thode she takes a lot of. And Trolsch broadcasts the datum and refers to Hal as a close source, which strikes Hal as odd and somehow off in a way he can't quite name. Kitten Plan shakes Chu's arm loose and darts over and extracts a warhead from SOVWAR's portable stockpile and shouts out that, well, okay then, if players can be targets, then in that case, and she fires a real screamer at Ingersoll's head, which Ingersoll barely blocks with his rosignol and shrieks that Kitten Plan can't launch anything at anything because she's been vaporized by a five megaton contact burst. Kitten Plan tells Ingersoll to write his congressman about it, and over Lamont Chu's pleas for reasoned discussion, takes several more theoretically valuable warheads out of the industrial solvent bucket and gets truly serious about hitting Ingersoll. Moving steadily east across Nigeria and Chad, causing Ingersoll to run due north across the court's map at impressive speed, abandoning I-R-L-I-B-Y-S-Y-R's ammo bucket and tear-assing up through Siberia, crying foul. Lords mewing ineffectually for order, but some of the other combatant staffs have begun to smell that Evan Ingersoll's become fair game for cruelty. The way kids can seem to smell this sort of thing out with such uncanny acuity. An R.E.D. C.H.I.'s general secretary and an A.M.N.A.T. vector planning specialist and Josh Gopnik all start moving east-northeast over the map, firing balls as hard as they can at Ingersoll who's dropped his launcher and is shaking frantically at the chained gate on the fence's north side, where Mrs. Incandenza has decided she doesn't want kids exiting the east courts and trampling her calliopsis, and these little kids can hit balls exceptionally hard. Hal is now unable to gather enough spit to spit. One warhead hits Ingersoll in the neck, and another solidly in the meat of the thigh. Ingersoll begins to limp around in small circles, holding his neck, crying in that slow-motion, shuddery way little kids have when they're crying more at the fact of being hurt than at the hurt itself. Pemulus is walking backwards away from the south fence, back toward the pavilion, and has both arms up in either appeal or fury or something. Axford tells Hal and Trollsch he wishes he didn't feel the dark thrill he felt watching Ingersoll get pummeled. Some filmy red peanut skin has gotten into Jim Strzok's hair as he lies there, motionless. O.P. Lord attempts to rule that Ingersoll is no longer on the four courts of Eschaton's earth map and so isn't even theoretically a valid target area. It doesn't matter. (laughs) Several kids close in on Ingersoll, triangulating their bombardment. T. Peterson on point. Ingersoll is hit several times, once, right near the eye. Jim Trolsch is up and running to the fence, wanting to stop the thing, but Pemulus catches him by his headset's cord and tells him to let them all lie in their own bed. Hal, now leaning forward, steeple-fingered, finds himself just about paralyzed with absorption. Trevor Axford, fist to chin, asks Hal if he's ever just simply fucking hated somebody without having any idea why. Hal finds himself riveted at something about the degenerating game that seems so terribly abstract 
and fraught with implications and consequences that even thinking about how to articulate it seems so complexly stressful that being almost incapacitated with absorption is almost the only way out of the complex stress. Now IND, PAK's Penn, and AMNAT's McKenna, who have long-standing personal bones to pick with Anne Kitten Plan, peel off and gather ordnance and execute a pincer movement on Anne Kitten Plan. She is hit twice from behind at close range. Ingersoll has long since gone down and is still getting hit. Lord is ruling at the top of his lungs that there's no way AMNAT can launch against itself when he gets tagged right on the breastbone by an errant warhead. Clutching his chest with one hand, with the other he flicks the red beanie's propeller never before flicked, whose Flick spin heralds a worst case and utterly decontrolled Armageddon type situation. Timmy Peterson takes a ball in the groin and goes down like a sack of refined flour. Everybody's scooping up spent warheads and totally unrealistically refiring them. The fences shudder and sing as balls rains against them. Ingersoll now resembles some sort of animal that's been run over in the road. Trolsch, who's looking for the first time at the idling sedan by Westhouse's dumpsters and asking if anybody knew who drove a non-Hagen aspirin advertising Ford, is the only upper-class spectator who doesn't seem utterly silently engrossed. Aunt Kittenplan has dropped her racket and is charging McKenna. She takes two contact bursts in the breast area before she gets to him and lays McKenna out with an impressive left cross. Lamont Chu tackles Todd Pulsaweight from behind. Struck looks to have wet his pants in his sleep. J.J. Penn slips on a grounded warhead near Fiji and goes spectacularly down. The snowfall makes everything gauzy and terribly clear at the same time, eliminating all visual background so that the map's action seems stark and surreal. Nobody's using tennis balls now anymore. Josh Gopnik punches Lamont Chu in the stomach, and Lamont Chu yells that he's been punched in the stomach. Ann Kittenplan has Kieran McKenna in a headlock and is punching him repeatedly on the top of the skull. Otis P. Lord lets down the beach umbrella and starts pushing his crazy wheeled food cart at a diskette rattling clip toward 12's open south gate. Still, flicking furiously at the red beanie's propeller. Struck's hair is steadily accreting nutskins. Pemulus is undercover but still standing, his legs well apart and his arms folded. The figure in the green fort hasn't moved once. Trolsch says he, for his own part, wouldn't be just sitting and lying there if any of the little buddies under his personal charge were out there getting potentially injured. And Hal reflects that he does feel a certain sort of intense anxiety, but can't sort out through the almost infinite-seeming implications of what Trolsch is saying fast enough to determine whether the anxiety is over something about what he's seeing, or something in the connection between what Trolsch is saying and the degree to which he's absorbed in what's going on out, inside the fence which is a degenerative chaos so complex in its disorder that it's hard to tell whether it seems choreographed or simply chaotically disordered. La Manchu is throwing up into the Indian Ocean. Todd Pulsawait has his hands to his face and is shrieking something about his doze. It is now beyond any argument or equivocation, snowing. The sky is off-white. Lord and his cart are now literally making tracks for the edge of the map. Evan Ingersoll hasn't moved in several minutes. Penn lies in a whitening service box with one leg bent beneath him at an impossible angle. Aunt Kittenplan begins to chase R-E-D-C-H-I's General Secretary South across the Asian subcontinent at top speed. Pemulus is telling Hal he hates to say he told him so. Hal can see Axford leaning way forward, sheltering something tiny from the wind as he flicks at it with a spent lighter. 
It occurs to him, this is the third anniversary of Axe Handle losing a right finger and half his right thumb. Fierce little Jay Gopnik is flailing at the air and telling whoever wants it to come on, come on. Otis P. Lord and his cart sail, clattering across Indochina toward the southern gate. Hal is suddenly aware that Trolsch and Pemulus are wincing. But it is not himself wincing, and he isn't sure why they are wincing, and is looking out into the fray, trying to determine whether he should be wincing, when R.E.D., C.H.I.'s general secretary, calling loudly for his mother and in full flight as he looks over his shoulder at Anne Kittenplan's contorted face, barrels directly into Lord Speeding Food Cart. There's a noise, like the historical sum of all cafeteria accidents everywhere. 3.6 megabyte diskettes take flight like mad bats across what uncovered would be the baseline of Court 12. Different colored beanies spill from the rolling solander box, whose lock's hasp is broken and protrudes like a tongue as it rolls. The TP's monitor and modem and you sheet you chassis with most of Estraton's nervous system on its hard drive assume a parabolic southwest vector. The heavy equipment's altitude is impressive. An odd silent still moment hangs, the TP aloft. Pemulus bellows, his hands to his cheeks. Otis P. Lord hurdles the bent forms of food guard and general secretary and sprints low over the court's map snow, trying to save hardware that's now at the top of its rainbow's arc. It's clear Lord won't make it. It's a slow-motion moment. The snow falls more than heavy enough now, Hal thinks, to excuse Lord's not seeing Lamont Chu directly before him, on his hands and knees throwing up. Lord impacts Chu's arched form at about knee level and is spectacular spectacularly airborne. The idling Ford reveals a sudden face at the driver's side window. Axford is holding the lighter's chassis up to his ear and shaking it. And Kittenplan is ramming R.E.D. C.H.I.'s leader's face repeatedly into the mesh of the south fence. Lord Flight's parabola is less spectacular on the y-axis than the T.P.'s had been. The you shit use hard drive chassis makes an indescribable sound as it hits the earth and his brightly circuited guts come out. The color monitor lands on its back with its screen blinking error at the white sky. How and everyone else can project Lord's Blight's own terminus an instant before impact? For a brief moment, that Hal will later regard as completely and uncomfortably bizarre. Hal feels at his own face to see whether he is wincing. The distant whistle patweets. Lord does indeed go head first down through the monitor screen and stays there, his sneakers in the air and his warm-up pants sagging upward to reveal black socks. There'd been a bad sound of glass. Pen flails on his back. Pulsal weight. Ingersoll and McKenna bleed. The second shift's 1,600-hour siren, down at Sunstrand Power and Light, is creepily muffled by the no sound of falling snow. <laughs>